to uh, Resurrection Sunday, uh, the Feast of First Fruits was the thing. Remember last week I, I started talking a lot about the Feast of Moses, the seventh Feast of Moses that we have in, in uh, the Old Testament in the Law, and um, we know that Jesus fulfilled the first three during his Passion Week while he was there. Three of those feasts, the meaning behind them, what they were looking forward to, were fulfilled while he was there through them. And uh, he was the Passover lamb. Uh, many people a couple of days ago had these uh, uh, Good Friday services. And I can remember being a kid, I don't know about you, but I can remember thinking, why in the world would you call that good? Because I had, you know, we didn't have crucifixes like Catholic kids had crucifixes. We just had a big cross. But uh, I always thought, well, that's pretty gruesome. But then I remember a time in my life thinking that, but they get to remember all the time. They get to see exactly what he did in their little symbol that they had, you know. But, but they would have a Good Friday service and all that, and I'd be saying, what's so good about it? That's when he died. You know, I, I didn't want him to have to die, but the fact he did, it did happen, he came to die. That was his mission. It was forecast many, many, many hundreds of years before that that's what he was going to do. In fact, as we went over last week, Genesis chapter 5, um, in the names of the first 10 generations, we have the gospel being told. From Adam to Noah, their names translated being man, was appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest or hope. Noah's name had like three meanings there. But that's really what those meanings and put them in a sentence and look, the gospel was told in Genesis chapter 5. And what I grew up thinking was a very boring chapter in the Bible. You know, so anyway, we learn these things that we go through. Today, um, we were still kind of, we're going to take up from the Passover Seder, uh, and the Passover feast that was going on of those first three. Um, we know the first four have been fulfilled by now, and the last three are yet to come. They have not been fulfilled as of yet. Uh, we're, we're still waiting for that to happen. So uh, uh, that will happen, and it's kind of funny that the first three, first four, because Pentecost was the fourth one that was fulfilled that same year. Uh, the first four were fulfilled on the day that they were being observed. Very interesting, right? So that kind of makes us think that the that all the, the meanings of the others and what they symbolize in the last three that are later in the year, there. What, what don't you think that they might just be fulfilled on the dates that are the dot the days that they're being observed as well? Yeah, I think it probably will. We'll see. Don't know what year that'll be. But it's just very likely, if we're paying attention and we're uh, using a discerning eye when we look at Scripture, that that just might be when those events will be fulfilled. So, anyway, back to the Passover Seder today. In the modern Passover Seder, and we don't have it set up here for you, and I thought about having some visual aids and having the four cups set before us here, and uh, talking about the Afikomen, the uh, that when you when he broke the bread in the seder, they'll have one of the kids. They'll wrap it up in a cloth and hand it to him, and have him go hide it somewhere in the house. And that's called the afikomen. And what that means is that which will return. Interesting, huh? Very interesting that that Christ is in all of the symbolisms of the seder, and the Jews don't even get that for the most part, except those completed Jews that have figured it out and they and they see that how much he fulfilled. But the four cups of wine are very interesting too. There's four cups of wine out there. And those, the reason they, they, they got this practice of having the four cups of wine out there, they all go back to a prophecy that was made back in the Old Testament. And I'll get there in a few minutes, but I'm giving you something to look forward to there in our symbolism. Because imagine, if you will, that I have four set up right here. Okay, and two of them are empty. And two of them are not. Okay, so the first two have already been used. And the second two still have the wine in them, right? Okay. And as we approach the Seder, 
will pick up in that time period, but I'll get there in a few minutes. But I, I want to remember the, 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 the four cups, the matzotash, which is the bread that was broken, and that was symbolic of his body, and, and it's broken. And nowadays when you go and you buy the matzah, it's usually perforated. It's pierced, right? Pierced for, he was pierced for our transgressions. You can't tell me a bunch of rabbis made that one up. No, because they don't think it was him. Right, but they still have you know it's still there. Interesting stuff. Anyway, um, those are the main elements of the part of the seder that we will deal with because they're the parts where we get our the Lord's Supper from. Was those two elements of the seder, and Jesus converted the Passover remembrance into the Lord's Supper and ordained that for us to remember, even though He fulfilled Passover. He gave us that section of it that we'll get back to for us to remember and remember his death until he returns. Not till he raises again on Sunday, but till he returns. That's what he was forecasting, what he was looking forward to. Do this as often as you do this, remember me and what I've given to you anyway. So our next stop in the, in the, in the Bible, if we were going through scripture and everything, is gonna be the day of preparation. Uh, we get on the 10th of Nisan uh, in 33 AD, on the 10th of Nisan, we call that Palm Sunday. And, and we talked about that last week. Last week was the observance of Palm Sunday. Uh, Jesus chose to ride in on the donkey that day into Jerusalem. And the crowds were singing praises, waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna. Right? We sang about that a minute ago. He comes as the selected one. Now, a lot of times you've said that, you know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Messiah, Hosanna. But there's another way of looking at what that, translating that, the selected one. Hang on to that word, the selected one, because we're fulfilling an observance of the Passover here. That's what's, what he was doing. He came in as the selected one. And the reason that's important, because, because on the day of preparation, which that day was, the families around Jerusalem and Jewish families that would be, you know, well, if they're near the temple where they could travel there and, and all of that, they, they would be doing this. But even if there was somewhere else and observing Passover with a lamb and all that and painting the blood on the doorposts, and, and, and all these things that they would be doing it at the same time, the same day. And the day of the 10th was the day of preparation. If he comes as the selected one, the family was going out to the flocks and selecting a lamb that they were going to take home to slaughter. And for them, that was the selected one. Right? Get it? But Jesus comes riding in on a donkey, and basically, people are calling him the selected one. Okay, remember that. Hang on to it. They would take the lamb in, and they would check it out for four days. Which is kind of funny, because the kids start playing with the lamb, probably naming it, and everything else like that. And uh, it, they should have just named it Passover, you know, because that was where that lamb was headed. You know, but don't you hate that when the kids start, you know, uh, naming and playing with their food, you know, before it gets slaughtered, you know. I, anyway, uh, I know some families are like, oh, we would never do that. Food comes from the store, right? You know, well, I grew up, we had to, we had to actually kill some of the, the food that we ate uh, a few times. And uh, it, it made it hard for the kids, but it was a valuable lesson to learn, I think. But anyway, as they were checking out this lamb for four days, you might wonder why they had four days to bring it, to go and select their lamb, take it home and get used to it and look it over, because it might have been bleached out, right? Someone might have been selling lambs up at the temple or wherever, and they might have had the temple seal on them, that this is a good kosher lamb, you can buy this one, we approve of it already. And you might get home and someone's like, uh, kind of bleached it out and everything, and it's not spotless. It does have blemish. It's not good enough for the sacrifice, you see. Now, I don't know how nitty-gritty they got with it. In the actual practice, they probably did a lot of, well, that's close enough, you know. Uh, but that was the reason for the four days before the day of slaughtering the lambs, when everybody did it at twilight. 
uh, the whole community did at the same time at twilight, they would go out and slaughter these lambs that they had selected four days prior. Jesus comes in as the selected one and he's around Jerusalem for four days. And on that evening that he was arrested and dragged into the court, when they brought him before Pilate, John 19, 6 is, is a very, very important verse for us to remember. Because Pilate, a Gentile, he spoke prophecy that day, basically. Pilate says, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. So, who was the inspector to inspect this lamb, the selected one, and say it was a good enough, there is no fault in this, there's no spot or blemish, in I find him, no fault in him. Yeah, the Roman governor, Pilate, he's the one that pronounced it. So, that God used him to speak for God, I find no fault in him, that he will do. This will be a fitting sacrifice. Interesting, isn't it? Because it, on the day it was being observed is when it was fulfilled. The meaning of it was fulfilled. All of these things just line up so perfectly. It just blows the mind if you're really paying attention. So Jesus then is, is taken to be crucified, laid in the tomb. At the exact time uh, of his death, tens of thousands of lambs were being slaughtered um, in the temple area and around. And at the same time, and people were going in to have the evening meal and the Seder, and that Jesus had observed it early with his disciples. Interesting. He observed the Seder early with them. Why? Because he wasn't, he wasn't going to be there then. And there was some debate on which day it was anyway. The calendar could have been a little bit mixed up, and it might have been that he actually observed it on the correct day, and the calendar did it. So we don't know. We're not going to make too much out of that. We just know that he observed it the night before, uh, with his buddies there, and they had the Seder, and that's where um, he did all of the, some of the best teaching moments he had were, were that night at the Last Supper. So, anyway, um, so now, I've already, okay, I covered Isaiah 53, 5 through 7, it says, he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And um, so we need to understand that, um, that Jesus was that sacrifice for us. And it's interesting that Isaiah, way back, had prophesied how it would be. Talk about the piercing, you know, and crushed. He was beaten, right? They, they, they beat him, but they didn't break his bones. There's another verse that says his bones wouldn't be broken. But anyway, uh, Luke 22, 15 through 16, takes us back to the Seder. Well, the Last Supper, we'll call it here, when Jesus was eating with his disciples. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So he's saying, basically, this is the last time this, you know, it's this, what it means, what this Seder means will be fulfilled before we observe it again. Well, they're, they're fulfilling it this week, so he means this year. Now, they didn't know at the time that it was actually going to be later that night when it started being fulfilled and all of it, it was happening that week, not just sometime that year. Uh, they didn't quite all understand that, but he said, before I would observe this again, before we would observe this, it'll be fulfilled. This is the last time, and I've been waiting for this one because I'm gonna change it up here for you a little bit now because I want you to keep on remembering, but we're gonna change it a little bit and we're gonna call it the Lord's Supper from now on. You know, of course, I'm paraphrasing a lot, but that's what happened, right? Okay, so Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, broke it, and said, this is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. Remember that, every time we observe communion, we see that, and that was, he was the Passover lamb, and, and he was giving us these things. So, the four cups, now we're back to the four cups. 
We're going to flash back to Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. The four cups come from those couple verses right there. Now, I want you to realize when we translate things, when you translate from one language into, a neck, into another, or the words kind of get jumbled. You play word jumble a little bit because sometimes you have to move the verbs, you have to do your sentence structure a little bit different. And, and if you've ever tried to, you know, in high school do the, the translate Spanish into English or English into Spanish, you, you learned that, that it doesn't always line up word right on word. So that also happens here. In our English translation, in order to make it flow and sound right, uh, they, 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 they word it like this. Let's read it. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Now these things, they, in, in the old language, the rabbis get four I wills from God out of this. And I know when we read them, we hear we read it more often than that because our sentence is saying like the same thing twice in a couple of these sentences, but they get four points out of it. So they put the four points into cups in the Seder. Each of the cups during the Seder was symbolic of one of these I will statements. We have the cup, and they call them, they have the cup of sanctification. Now I'm going to put them in order of which they are observed during the Seder. But that's not exactly the same order they are in verses 6 and 7 here. Because, you know, he just, he made the statement, but they happen in a little bit different order. Okay, that's okay. He's God, he can do that. Right? But here's, they have the, the cup of sanctification would be that first one. Right? Uh, sanctification or calling. They might have called it the cup of calling. Uh, the cup of deliverance or rescue was the second one. Uh, the cup of redemption or payment is the third one. And then the fourth one is the cup of hope. All right? Now, it's very interesting. In Luke's gospel, when Jesus is taking the cup, according to the Seder's service, that would have been the third cup, the cup of redemption that he took and passed around. This is my blood. Right? His blood is our redemption. So it's very fitting. And that third cup, when we do communion, the cup that we take and we drink in communion is, comes out of the third cup during the Passover Seder. That's what it is, okay? It's the cup of redemption. Because uh, the, uh, the, the cup of, of sanctification or calling, you know, I, I will take you to be my own people. That's verse 7. Uh, the cup of deliverance, though, is, is I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. Uh, and free you from being slaves and redeem you. That's, that's one thing. That's the cup of, uh, of deliverance or rescue. So he did that. Okay, He did the deliverance or the rescue and, and the calling of Israel. He called them out to be his own people. And he delivered and rescued them from the yoke of slavery to the Egyptians. That's why those two cups are empty in, in my symbolic uh, gesture here today. The ones that I set before you, imaginary, <laughs> they're not really here, but those two are empty. They've been done already. Those had to do with Israel, and they were done. This third one also has, it all has to do with Israel, by the way. But this third one is the cup of, of the uh, redemption, the, the payment that was made. And that's the one he's telling them is his blood poured out for them. He's telling these guys that night before that he's going to die. And that, that he is going to fulfill this. Remember we, we read already that uh, John the Baptist, when Jesus was walking around through there, uh, coming along the trail and John's out in the river and he's baptizing people and everything. He spotted Jesus up and he, he points at him and tells the whole crowd, hey look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He, already, he called it. He called Jesus that. The people that are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, and all that, they're calling him the selected one, the, the lamb. He's there on the day of preparation. And then when they were slaughtered, he's crucified. It all is being fulfilled as it's being observed that year. Very important year in history, right? 33 AD, as we see it in our calendar, 
Uh, and that's why we remember this time and the passion of God during this time. But we know that his death on the cross wasn't the end of things. That wasn't the whole thing. But remember, every time we do that, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And if we were taking communion right now, and I was giving this lesson in the communion, then we would, we would partake of the, of the wine now because we would have already done the thing with the bread and have somebody cart off part of it and all of that. You know, call it the Ephekum in that which will return because he will return. He will come back, right? All right. So that brings us to today. And you're like, wow, finally, we're, we're up to date. Yeah. Well, that brings us to today because I want to go now into the Feast of First Fruits. It's interesting that that was also the same week. Now, it wouldn't always turn out exactly the same, but it would have been on the first day because they were told to do it on the first day. Uh, and, and it would have been after the Passover. So anyway, we'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. But, but um, the seven feasts of Moses, there were three compulsory compulsory feasts that all able-bodied Jews were expected to travel to Jerusalem for back in those days. Um, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And if you're there for those three, then you're going to end up observing all seven, most likely, because they're observed in, in, close in time. Uh, the first three, then you've got 50 days till the fourth one, and then later in the fall, you have the last three that are all right close to each other observed. But you've got um, the, the, the first month of the Jewish ceremonial calendar was Aviv, which uh, contains, or Nisan later, they called it Nisan, but in, um, uh, ceremonially, they call it Aviv, was the original Hebrew name for that month, Aviv. And, they probably, a lot of times, will pronounce the V with a B, so you know, Abib, you know? Anyway, that's, that's where that comes from. That contains Passover, which is on the 14th. Uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a seven-day period from the 15th to the 22nd, usually. And the Feast of First Fruits, which is the first day after the Sabbath after Passover. When you read back to when they were supposed to do it, it's the first day, which means Sunday to us, right? It's the first day after the Sabbath, after Passover. Now you gotta remember, there are more Sabbaths to the Hebrew calendar than the 52 weeks, or well, to them, you know, however many weeks they had, but um, 360 day years every month was a 30 day month, you know, and all of that. But they had um, every seventh day, which is Saturday now to us, was Sabbath. But there are more Sabbaths because there are other days that were they were told to do this on this certain day and that will be a Sabbath to you. So it's an additional. So you have to remember that when you're reading the scripture, there are more Sabbaths than just every Saturday. There are a few more, not a ton more, but a few more. And they all have to do with the feasts and around the, the, the festivals and feasts of Moses. So um, because this the day of Passover is a Sabbath day, whether it came on Saturday or not. You see, it was a Sabbath. That day was. So, um, the second compulsory pilgrimage feast is that of Pentecost, which means 50. The word just means 50. I know you see it out there meaning a lot of things on a lot of buildings and, and churches, but the word means 50th. <laughs> That's where we get that. And it's this, this 50th day after the Feast of First Fruits. So you have a week of weeks, right? A week is seven, a grouping of seven weeks of seven days. So that's 49 days after the Feast of First Fruits is that 50th day. That's the day they were to observe the uh, Pentecost. And the really weird thing about Pentecost, Pentecost was a really weird, it didn't match any of the other seven. It's the one oddball. The other six are very Jewish, right? Unleavened bread and things like that. This one, you let the dough rise. Yeast is in it, and you bake a puffed up bread, loaves of bread, and bring them and wave them before the Lord. On the, that's the Feast of Pentecost. The symbolism there 
We know, because we know now what happened in hindsight, the symbolism of the yeast in the dough and that which uh, inflated it and everything was non-Israel people, Gentiles. There would be a mix of Jews and Gentiles together in this new loaf offered to God. So this new thing offered to God wasn't just Jewish people. It was Gentiles as well. And we know that was the beginning of the church. And it was marked by signs and wonders. And people were praising God in languages that they didn't know. They hadn't learned. But people outside that had pilgrimaged to Jerusalem there recognized those as being languages from the lands they came from. And they came out and they interpreted and they said, look, you know what these guys are saying? They're praising God in a language from that we're, the we're used to hearing back home. I recognize what they're saying, right? And then other people, oh, they've had too much to drink. They're drunk, you know, and they try to explain it that way. But we know that was a great thing. That was the Feast of Pentecost that came in 50 days from now. Because today we're observing the Feast of First Fruits. Why is the Feast of First Fruits so important to us? Because our hope, that fourth cup that Jesus didn't drink that night, that fourth cup is symbolic of our great hope. Our great hope as the Christian church is that day of resurrection or the translation rapture of those who are alive at the time. The day of the rapture, the translation of the people or resurrection of those that are dead in Christ. That day is our great hope. That's that cup of hope we're waiting for where we get to shed the old and the mortality and all that and we put on immortality and we go to meet the Lord in the air and we're with Him forever from that point on. We're with Him. That's our hope. And that's why Jesus didn't drink that fourth cup that night because He was giving us symbolism. But that's going to be our marriage supper of the Lamb or the great banquet is that that fourth cup is that day. It's the Christian's great hope. And we're the puffed up yeast bread that's waved on the 50th day after the Passover or after the uh, Feast of First Fruits. Anyway, let's get up here to verses uh, Leviticus 23, 9 through 11. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest, Bring to the priest a sheep of the first grain you harvest. He is to wave the sheep before the Lord so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. Now this is, if you read this in other, uh, other places, this is it's talking about the Feast of uh, um, Pentecost here. And uh, when they go into more detail in other places, we, we learn that, that that is bread with yeast. So... In 33 AD, on the first day of the festival of weeks, the Feast of Weeks, you know, um, or, or the first Feast of First Fruits, see the Feast of Weeks, like, ends at Pentecost, and it's that time period, that 49 days time period between Feast of First Fruits and Pentecost, okay? The first day of that festival, that, that Feast of Weeks, seven week period, is the Feast of First Fruits. Okay, so and it starts, hopefully it starts to make sense to you and you get it and it's, I don't know, is it clear as mud? At least, you know, ho ho hopefully it, it comes out to you. But that's, the, this first day of the Feast of Weeks is Feast of First Fruits, which is the first day after the Sabbath after Passover. Okay, if you put it on a calendar, you can put the dots there and you can follow it and it makes perfect sense, you know, but anyway. So, 33 AD, on the first day of the festival of weeks, or the, the first feast of first fruits, Christ was raised from the dead that day. So what does the feast of first fruits symbolize? First fruits of what? The resurrection. He is our first fruits of the resurrection that we hope for, that we're, we're waiting for. We're waiting for the, our great hope, but He was the first fruits of that. If the first fruits happens, you're guaranteed a harvest later, right? Guaranteed a harvest later. So it, the fact that, Jesus, that God raised Him from the dead 
was like our guarantee that it worked. That God accepted this sacrifice that Jesus came to do so because we couldn't do it ourselves. We, our righteousness is never going to be enough. No matter how hard we try, you'd never be good enough to stand before the all-perfect God. You can never out of your righteousness. And that's the reason the king sent out robes for us to wear to the wedding. Because you don't get in on your own clothing. Right? We, we come to that, that wedding banquet that we've been invited to wearing the righteousness of Christ. Not our own. That's what that parable of Jesus was talking about. Uh, when, the, when they sent out the ropes for them to wear. And some of them came trying to wear their own clothes. And they were thrown out where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right? Into utter darkness, it said. That's those that try to attempt uh, getting there on their own merit. The false gospel of the gospel of earning your salvation. That's just wrong. You can't. It, it won't happen. That's the apostate church that believes that, that says, I'll get there on my own merit. You know, you wear the clothing of Jesus. He shed that for you. And because he was raised from the dead, you know that your hope of also being in the resurrection will come true because God accepted it. And that's what we celebrate this time of the year, every year. It's a good thing to celebrate, don't you think? All right, he is the first fruit. Now I want to go forward to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, it's not all on the screen behind me. I'm, I'm going to read verses 14 through 19 here. Uh, but some of the snippets will be up there. Paul starts out, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then those who also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we're of all people most to be pitied. Yeah. If this is all there is, Amy Grant had a song Oh, that was a long time ago, I guess. Is, is this all there is? Anyway, yeah, I was just reminded of that as, I, as I'm reading this. If this is all there is, then why do we bother to be good? Why do we bother to be honest and, um, and deprive ourselves of any pleasure that our minds concoct? Anything that your mind wants, why not go ahead and go out and do it? Why do you deprive yourself of anything you would want if this is all there is? <laughs> You ever thought about that that way? If this is all there is, well, you just want to be remembered as someone who was good? How, what does that do you in the grave? What, how, what good does that do you? Right? No, but we all know, down deep inside, all humans know this isn't all there is. No matter how much they may try to, to deny that fact and try to make up other things, down deep inside, they all know this is not all there is. It would make no sense for this to be all there is. So since we believe there is more than this, it's important that we figure out what it is. And if there is a creator, we, we probably accountable to him. And whatever rules he wrote are probably the ones we ought to pay attention to. Don't you think? You ought to pay attention and listen to him and go along with what he's called us to do. And, and he's thrown out a life preserver of salvation from the wicked way that we're stuck in otherwise. The, the old nature that we're stuck in unless we learn, come to a point to trust in Christ for that salvation. That's what it means to believe on the name of the Lord. You, know, you don't just believe in him. The demons do that, right? You shudder at the mention of his name. Believe in his existence like the Easter Bunny? You, you don't believe in the Easter Bunny, but you believe in the existence of Jesus, right? Well, that's not good enough. It doesn't set you apart from the demons at all or the fallen angels. The devil knows exactly the, the fact that Jesus exists. He knows that. Is he saved? I don't think so. You know, trust in him. 
is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, even just saying the Lord Jesus Christ is a, is a whole statement right there. It's not his last name, first name, and title. You know, it, it means something. And if you can say he's the Lord Jesus Christ, that's a whole big old, you know, you need to have that explained to you. You know, exactly what it is you're saying. You know, uh, and, and, and I know what it means, and I say it, and I mean it. And it does mean that to me. He is the Christ, the selected one, the payment that was made for me, the sent and selected one. He's my Christ. His name was Jesus here on this earth. And there was all kinds of symbolism, Yeshua, Yoshua, because vowels aren't in, you know, it's all consonants in the Hebrew language, right? So um, Joshua was the same name. Joshua of the Old Testament is the same name as Jesus. We put the hard J on it when the Germans got a hold of the Bible and translated it. Thanks, Luther, right? Yeah, actually, we should be thankful to Luther. But anyway, that's when the hard J got on there. Jehovah and Jesus, you know, in the original languages, it would have been a, more of a Y sound. Yeshua uh, or Joshua for Jesus and Yehovah which is just the tetragram. You, we've gone over this before, right? The Y-H-V-H, or the yah heh vah -he. uh, It just, he's the I am. I am that I am, right? That's what that means. So anyway, back to this, um, the verses that I have here. Um, the church has fallen into a great distraction in many areas. Uh, because he lives, we have the hope of our own resurrection. But the distraction that the church is in um, is, is it's because of a general laziness, I think. Uh, laziness to stay in the Word of God. People don't do that so much anymore. Um, the Word of God is not the main course at church meetings in most churches these days. And that's sad because it's supposed to be the main course. Uh, the Word of God and having it explained to you is the main course of coming together as the church. Sure, worship's part of it. Singing isn't the only way to worship, you know? So to have like an hour and a half of singing and then five minutes of, uh, of reading a verse and now let's pray and get out of here, you know, that's, that's not God, that's, that's a waste of time and it's very irresponsible for church leaders to do that with the people's time. We've been given a mandate in the pastoral epistles, we've been told to bring the word and explain the word to the people. And that's what our job is. And, and it's sad that it's not the main course so much anymore because if it was, people would still understand these things. And what, everything that I'm teaching here today would just be very, very uh, elementary to Christians that are in the word. They already know all this, right? They're not caught by surprise. And, and they've come to a point of being more mature in the knowledge of the Word of God, so they're not washed around back and forth by every wave of false doctrine that comes through the church, right? They're not tossed around by it because they've become more, more um, mature in the knowledge of the Word of the Lord. But if the Word of the Lord is not the main course in church meetings, they'll never get there. Keep them dumb and keep them coming and paying their tithe, right? This, then, then this business will keep rolling. We'll keep having lots of business. But... The church is becoming illiterate, basically. Anyway, that, that was a soapbox that I got on there for a minute. And I want to get back into the word here. So we gather to celebrate the resurrection of Christ our Lord because of the great hope that it brings to us. That's why. But to many of us, this day is called by that E word. And I have not used it yet today. You'll probably notice. Why hasn't he said, you know, what everybody else in the world is calling today? I don't like the word. The reason I don't like it now, I, I should get off my, uh, my nitty pick, nit, nitpicking here and just go along with everybody else, right? But the thing is, is that, that E word actually comes, it's, it's spelled improperly, but there was a pagan goddess Ishtar that was, that was worshipped in, in the, the old land, in the Canaan land, and all the surrounding people around Israel and even down into uh, Rome and the early Rome, when the church started out, you know, after Constantine said, hey, this is a good religion. Let's take that one and made Christianity OK. Right. Ishtar was being worshipped, this fertility goddess, all over that part of the world in those days. 
And of course, the new church hated the Jews so much because those Christ killers. We can't have anything to do with Passover. Right? So, let's not observe it on the same day. And let's not call it Passover and first feast of first fruits because feast of this, feast of that, that's Jewish stuff. Right? We're, we're the church now. We don't observe the Jewish things. And they wanted such a distancing from the Jews that they just said, but well, we need to have a, a, a celebrate his resurrection. Well, let's do it on the festival to Ishtar. It's, it's first fruits, right? It's new beginnings and everything. And they, they celebrate growth. And, and the, you know, the eggs are part of the symbolism. Uh, rabbits are part of it because they reproduce so much so quickly. That's why, you know, rabbits don't lay eggs. But the egg is also a symbol of fertility and new growth and new beginnings. And so, so it's in the springtime. It's, you know, time to, to celebrate stuff like that. And we'll just celebrate the resurrection of him on that day. Let's just call it Easter. That's why the word got out. And that's what the church embraced. Because nobody knows what we're supposed to know. Sure, we're a New Testament church. Absolutely. But our apostles that gave us the New Testament taught from the Old Testament. Because they understood it and it had been fulfilled and they knew what it meant. We're not under the law and we can't take everything that's written in there to mean it's written as a command to us. Because we are the church. It's different. But we learn from it. We get to know God a whole lot better by getting to know how he dealt with different people over different time periods. Yeah, they get to call them those dispensations of God's grace. Well, they are, you know, but... It, it's kind of like that. But the thing is, God's grace has been dispensed from the beginning. It's always been the way, you know, uh, even though we, they like to call this the dispensation of grace now. And before that was the dispensation of law. But salvation still only came by grace, even during the time period of the law. The law just served to show you you needed to be saved. You still had to put your faith in God's provision to actually be saved. Right. And you observe the law if you're a Jewish person to show that you trust in him. And even though you don't understand how this is going to work and what these things do for me, I trust in him, so I'm going to do what he told me to do. Right? Another soapbox. Anyway, we gather for this, and, 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 and I don't like those things, but I do like that everybody gets a chance to remember the resurrection of Jesus on this time. And so that, we should, as the church, we should magnify that and minimize the other stuff. Egg hunts and things like that. Okay, fine, whatever. I'm not anti-egg hunt, all right? I'm anti-telling kids that rabbits lay eggs. <laughs> you know, I, why would you tell them that? That's ridiculous. You know, I, I'm anti that. I'm not anti-hide-and-seek things and treasure hunts and things like that. I'm all for that kind of thing. It's fun. And for a great picnic and, and, a, and food, yeah, bring it on. Uh, having our uh, Resurrection Day uh, brunch that we normally do if we weren't all batting down the hatches and staying away from everybody right now, we would normally have that brunch this morning. And hey, food, bring it, bring it on. I love that kind of thing. And celebrate. But let's celebrate what we're supposed to be celebrating. Jesus died for us, but he resurrected. He's the first fruit of the resurrection that we hope to be a part of. He's the guarantee of it. And isn't that the thing that makes you feel good? 1 Corinthians still, chapter 15 still, a little further down in the chapter towards the end. Uh, verses 52 and 53, Paul said, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and will be changed. That's the resurrection we're hoping for, right? Now, if you read all the rest of that, you know that the rapture is a part of that too. It's the same event. The rapture of the church and the resurrection of the dead in Christ is the same event. It's the day when he, we go up and meet him in the air. He didn't step foot back on the earth yet. There's going to be a time period, an interval of time before he does that. I happen to believe it's at least seven years, but it doesn't have to only be seven. It could be a little longer than that. Because the rapture of the church does not have to 
be the date that ushers in the seven year period. There could be a time, there, in fact, I'm sure there will be a time period between that day and the whole world going over to agreeing to a, a, a peace treaty with this world leader. It's gonna take some time to set it up. How much time, I don't know. Could be a week, month, year, a couple years, I don't know. Doesn't matter to me because I'm not gonna be here, right? So that's not something I really concern myself with that much. I have come to the conclusion that I will not be here, and so, okay, that's what I want to know about then. Uh, and I, what does the Christian need to know about? That's what I want to put all my full attention into teaching. So I'm not teaching about things that happen during the tribulation period, because if you're paying attention and you put your faith in Christ, you're not going to endure it anyway. You won't be here to go through that. Anyway, two cents on that one. Back to the subject of first fruits. Jesus was the first fruits of our great hope. And Paul told us many different places about the rapture and, and that is going to happen. It's going to happen for us. But as you go out today, and normally you'd go out and meet with family and friends for lunch, uh, maybe even go out for an egg hunt and stuff like that. Let me give you a challenge though. And this year it's different because people are staying home and whatever they're doing, you know. But let me give you a challenge. As you see all the symbolism of fresh new beginnings, colored eggs, rabbits, yeah, because they multiply fast. Have you ever raised rabbits? That's why they're fertility symbols. Anyway, um, those are all symbols of fertility, which means fruit, which means productivity. All right? There should be productivity from the church. And this should be the time we celebrate the beginning of that. We're going to get it going now. We're going to become productive. They're, the church is going to start to produce fruit, to have a harvest, right? And, it, it, you know, you start the new year out with resolutions and all that. We should come to Resurrection Day, first fruits of the Resurrection Day every year with the idea this is when it starts. Now this is our work year. And the harvest is plentiful. It's, it's still out there. There are many people out there in the world that do believe in Him. They just don't like you. Right? They all trust in Him. They hate the church. And I'm sorry to say the church deserves it in, in a lot of times. The church did it to themselves. Part of it is because we don't read the Word of God and learn the things we're supposed to know. And we don't... We don't most of the time, we, I hate to even say we because I try very hard not to be a part of that, but we, the church, do not display the true face of Christ most of the time. When the woman's thrown down in the middle of a circle, down to the group, down, down, down to the floor, caught in sin, whatever, it doesn't matter what the sin is, we know all of us are guilty of sin. We start kicking before the church, spitting on dirty, rotten sinner. Look, you did it again. I have no patience for you because I know you keep doing this. So I'm going to kick you when you're down. I'm going to spit on you. I'm not going to treat you nice. I'm not going to treat you lovingly. I'm going to treat you as an outcast or whatever because you did this to me. I take it personal. You tripped over something. You're the one that got in sin, but I take it personal and hate you for it now. Because you sinned against me because you sinned. Because I had high hopes for you that you were going to do better. Right? Isn't that what the church does? The church the only army in the world that ever shot its own wounded. Right? And they do it all the time. Not us. Not here. That's not it. The true face of Christ is, hey, you with, without sin, cast the first stone. I'm guilty enough to be down there too. Different, different guilts, different sins, different things, but still deserve to be right down there in the dirt too. Right? That's me as well. Here, let me help you up. Yeah. Go and sin no more. If you can. <laughs> right? I mean, being logical, if you can, yeah, try it. You try it this week. Try to don't sin all week. The end of the week, if you think that you've done it, if you think you've gone all week and you didn't sin all week, come talk to me. We'll have a little chat. I'll convince you that you did. I, I'm good. I know how to do that. We'll just look at the, at the, the Ten Commandments. 
And, and I'll convince you that yes, you did. I know for certain you sinned this week. You're going to. You're going to keep on doing it. But that's why His covering and His righteousness is, uh, is around us because it's not mine. I'm going to keep getting up every time I fall in that gutter. I'm going to keep getting up again. And everybody else that falls in the gutter, I'm going to tell them, don't stay in the gutter. Get back up. You stay in it, you're, you're living defeated. You're right where the devil wants you. Get back up out of it and keep going. And if you trip and fall in it again, get back up and go again. Seventy times seven. Right? Because that's the Lord we serve. He said, uh, I don't condemn you. His Holy Spirit will convict you that what you're doing was wrong, but He doesn't condemn us. Paul said in the, first, in the eighth chapter of Romans, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. Right? But the church sure thinks so. Stop being that. And I know I'm on video and this is going out and lots of people are there. Well, there are eight of us here in the room today because it's just the crew to put this on for all the rest of you great folks that are sitting at home and comfortable. Um, so make sure you understand this. Don't be that. Don't be that. Be the true face of Christ. But make sure if you haven't yet, you do come to a point where you trust in Him for your salvation. Because it's not about a certain walk up the aisle. It's not about a certain prayer. Because the, the one thing all sinners' prayers have in common, uh, because they're all different, but the one thing they all have in common, there wasn't one in the Bible. Nowhere. You know, other than the thief on the cross, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. Pretty simple, isn't it? He knew who he was and he trusted in him. Simple as that. Come to a point where you trust in Christ's completed work on the cross for your eternal security and then start living like it and standing in it. You can learn more about yourself and about your relationship to God after that. Uh, don't just stay in your ignorance because that's what's happened to the church. All right, let me close in prayer because you probably all want to eat now anyway. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the Feast of First Fruits, all the symbolism that it brought. Uh, thank you for fulfilling it on the day it was being observed so that we, we, we couldn't miss it then. We would understand what's happening here and what happened for us. And I thank you so much for teaching us these things in your word and for your Holy Spirit convicting us and convincing us that this is right. We thank you for that, Lord, and we ask a blessing on us as we go and as we go out into the world and do our business, uh, whatever it happens to be, uh, that you will be with us and you will be guiding and directing and protecting as we go. We thank you for this opportunity and all these things we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.